Um, a common mistake that people make when they're running communities is they're so obsessed with over delivering value for members, they forget about the value for themselves. So how exactly do you bring value to your community members? I want to start here because without getting this fundamental foundational piece right, you're going to struggle. If the value isn't there, if there isn't a compelling reason for people to sign up and stick around in your community, you're really going to struggle and no amount of marketing is going to help you. First of all, community is a bit of a buzzword. It's a bit of a trend and a lot of people are starting community just because they feel like they have to. That is not a good reason to start communities because community is a lot of work. Also realize that value is not a list of features. Often when you say to someone, why should I sign up to your community? They say, well, we have this many you know, things going on and, and this many bonuses and you can get these free resources when you sign up and they start listing features. I believe the strongest type of value proposition for a community is predicated on transformation. So you're going to take your members from point A, their starting point, to point B. And this is much more compelling for people than a list of features. So for example, as I mentioned, I run learn.community, a community for community builders. And we have two transformations that we offer. We have people that have no community and we take them to launching their first community. So it's a very clear, you know, from point A to point B, from having no community to launching a community. And we also have people that already run communities, but their community is struggling. Maybe the engagement isn't enough. Maybe it's not scaling. Maybe they have some mindset issues. And we take their community from struggling to thriving. And again, this is something we can use in all of our marketing, all of our copy. Uh, when I mention it on talks like this, it's quite a clear value proposition. It's not me listing 18 different features or benefits. And these are some common transformations. Maybe you can think how these might apply to a community that you're looking to start or a community that you're already running. Perhaps your members are feeling unconfident in a certain area. And by being a member of your community, being part of it, you're going to take them to feeling confident. Maybe they're feeling very muddy or unclear on a certain topic. And so you're going to help them to feel clarity on this topic. Maybe they're aspirational. They think, I really want to learn something. I really want to develop in some area, maybe develop some skills. And so you help them achieve this. Maybe they're going from wanting to be a photographer and your community empowers and enables them to learn photography and become a seasoned photographer. And a very common one, maybe they're feeling lonely. They're feeling like they're the only one doing this thing. And when they're in a closed space, a community of like-minded people going through a similar journey, similar struggles, and similar aspirations, they get this sense of support and belonging. And that can be a very powerful transformation for them. So once you've defined this transformation, you need to think about how to structure the inner parts of your community to help your members fulfill this transformation. And there's many different types of community structure and value you can provide to fulfill that transformation. The first of which is educational. Maybe your community offers some learning content. It could be tutorials and tricks and tips and that kind of thing, which you're sharing only for your members. Um, something like a knowledge hub or a video library is a great way of organizing a lot of this learning into an actual educational pathway so that members can self-identify where they're at in that learning journey and then just work sequentially through it. And this is particularly effective because it serves your passive learners. In every community, you're going to get your super users who are chatting all the time and being very active, asking questions and joining live calls like this. But you're also going to get your passive learners who just want to quietly kind of consume material and not be as vocal. And within a community, you'll get all these different types of members, and that's entirely normal. A lot of community builders get scared about having more passive members and they want more active members, but a community is really an ecosystem with all these different types of members and it's your job to try and provide and cater for all of them. And within, within educational content, you can also do live calls, live workshops, presentations, and bring in guest experts um, like Spire Summit have done so successfully today. You can do challenges as well, and these can be very powerful. It could be a daily challenge, it could be weekly um, or even monthly. And this is a great way where you as a community leader can set a challenge for all of your members, and then people participate as a collective. 
So they're not doing this solo. They're actually participating and seeing other members participate. And that inspires um, one another. And a couple of examples of this, you may have seen if you're in the creative space, that's Inktober, where every October there's like this, you know, 31 day challenge, posting a piece of art every single day. And millions of creatives all over the world participate in this. It's a very powerful sense of belonging throughout the month of October. There's also Tweet 100. This is my friend Jay Klaus. He just started this challenge on Twitter. Um, and after 100 days of committing to tweet every single day, he had 1,600 members in this new Twitter community, each of them tweeting every day, supporting each other, following each other, um, and a real sense of community formed. And you know, this is the power of challenges. You can start a challenge and literally just three months later, you can have thousands of people participating uh, and bonding over that shared vision. Questions. Um, if your community is this kind of utilitarian feel where people want to go there to get help, structure and set out spaces where people can ask questions and get help from you as the community leader or community team, as well as help from other fellow members. And you can also do live things like we're doing today with AMAs, uh, that's Ask Me Anything, um, and you know, Q&A sessions and things of that nature. It's really important as well to set up collaborative spaces. Try and actually figure out ways for your members to connect with each other um, because the value really is in the collective. It's the sum is greater than the parts. So as the community leader, it's your job to find ways and structure and build out ways to bring your members together. This could be something like orchestrating masterminds where you create smaller groups within the main group where you connect like-minded members to work through an exercise or project together. It could be helping facilitate people finding accountability buddies or groups. Perhaps it's starting a collaborative project. So you post it in the community and anyone is welcome to join and collaborate in this. Um, and it's also just trying to look how can members fill in each other's blind spots. And I see this in my community all the time. So for example, in uh, learn.community, someone was asking about Discord. I gave some of my feedback, but then I could tag a member in who's a Discord expert and say, hey, Stephen, what do you think in this case? And they give a really, really good answer too. So it's about not having all the answers yourself and no one person having all the answers, but as a collective, we can fill in the gaps in each other's knowledge. And that's super important. Social, I think, no community should only be about business all the time or work all the time. You should actually be organizing just for fun hangouts. And this could be, you know, some drinks or some celebrations at the end of the week. Just figure out a way to bring people together. So at Design Cuts, my company, we have Friday fun calls. And on the end of Friday, we jump on for an hour on a live call with some of our core community members. And we do fun live drawing exercises and everyone laughs and jokes. And it's a nice way to unwind before the weekend. And try and think, how can you apply this fun, this social element to a community that you want to build? Validation and encouragement. And this is very powerful as well. Often people feel alone, um, particularly on social media, if they're not getting much engagement. So if they're a member of your community, is there somewhere they can share what they're working on? Maybe share their progress. It could be in something like a progress log. Share their struggles and get support from other members uh, or maybe get feedback. And again, this is where the power of the collective kicks in because if they have like-minded people who are resonating with them and helping them in these different areas and they get this sounding board experience, there's tremendous value in that. And also think about member-generated content. So um, all of this is great, but it shouldn't be that people are always looking to you as the community leader for every piece of value. You should actually be encouraging members, you know, have they got spaces where they can share their own advice, their own tips, their own learnings um, and experiences, because there's value in all of those. And the main point I want to underline here is that the value from members is so much more powerful than just the value from you. Uh, and that's why I keep kind of hammering this point home. You need to structure your community in a way that it doesn't all come from you as the community leader, because that's a dangerous place to be in. The strongest communities are really where the community leader can not always be there, but the community continues to thrive. The members are generating content, the members are helping one another, um, and the power of that collective really starts to kick in. So as I just said, you know, find ways for members to generate value um, otherwise, really, it feels like more of a membership site 
than necessarily a community. I see a lot of people say, oh, I'm starting this community, but really it's just a place for them to serve their course or serve some videos um, under a kind of paid membership plan. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great and viable business model, but that is intrinsically more of a membership site than it is a community. A community is predicated on facilitating these different connections between your members and creating value therein. So once you've got your value prop, you thought about this transformation from A to B for your members, and then you've structured your community accordingly with some of the principles and areas I've just shared, um, you need to think, okay, I've got, I've got my value. Who am I going to bring into this community? You need to identify your ideal community member. And far too many people kind of open up a community and just say, oh, it's for anyone and everyone. And that's very, very dangerous. It's much better to be really intentional about the people you're actually looking to attract into your community. And the fundamental principle here is quality over quantity, because if you're just trying to flood as many people as you can into this community, it's going to fail. You're going to have uh, no clear focus. You're going to have a quite a low average quality of member, uh, and it's going to feel really disorganized and just lead to an absolute headache in terms of moderating this place. And this is probably the most common mistake. So, you know, if you're taking notes, please underline this one. I feel like the most common mistake people do starting a community is I need to get as many members in as possible, more, more, more. And they just try and funnel as many people into this community and then wonder why it fails. So think carefully, who is your ideal member? There's a few exercises for this, but I like starting with some of the basics. So, you know, think about hard metrics and soft metrics. Hard metrics are stuff like location, uh, you know, age brackets, gender if, uh, appropriate and relevant, income brackets if relevant, industry, education level, et cetera. And soft metrics are things like, you know, what are their hobbies and interests, their pain points and struggles, uh, what resonates with them, what kind of sense of humor do they have? So all of these, you know, you're just taking notes, you're brainstorming, you're noticing what you see, and you're trying to build this image of the, a fictional person. You're trying to create this member profile of your ideal perfect member. And you may be wondering, you know, how do I how do I figure this out? How do I discover these traits? Um, these are three of my favorite ways. So one is just go have one on one conversations with people. If you are looking to launch a community, but you already have a social media following, talk to some of your followers, ask to get on calls, talk to them in private, in DMs, et cetera, and just get to know them more. And you're trying to essentially use the current data you have. So if you have top customers within your business, start there. If you have most engaged followers or audience members, start there. You're trying to really get a feel for, you know, what are the patterns in my most committed, most engaged customers and supporters? And then also you need to really be aligned with your passions and areas of interest because it's no good serving a particular audience just because you think it has some business potential or community potential if it's something which you don't really care about because you're going to burn out and you're not going to be able to sustain serving that, that group of uh, people. So here's a look at my ideal member for Learn Community. <clears throat> First and foremost, they should run an existing community or they should be looking to launch one. They should have adequate time and focus to commit to this, even if it's a side hustle, because if they're too busy, they're not gonna be able to show up and participate. They should be willing to put in the hard work to, required to grow a community, because it is hard work. Um, and if they're kind of hands off, it's not gonna work. They should share my values of empathy, kindness, and have a people first mindset, because that's very important. I'm not looking to work with you know, sleazy marketers or, or pushy people or horrible people. They should have sufficient financial resources to commit to membership um, because it's a paid community, uh, not a free one. And they should be friendly and not take themselves too seriously. And I have you know, many other aspects of my audience persona, but this is some of the broad strokes. And I wanted to show this as a practical real world example of some of the work that I put in to get real clarity on my ideal member. Because what you can start to do on the back of this is you can start to understand who isn't a good fit for your community. And it's equally important to actually define and create a persona for who you definitely don't want as a member. And in my case, it's someone who isn't serious or committed to the act of community building. Maybe they don't have clear community goals um, or they just have no idea you know, what they want to do, what they want to offer or what their passions are. Maybe they need more of a life coach than a, a community coach at that point. Um, they're in client services. This is often not really appropriate for community building, which is fine. Client services is great, but there's people who serve others in client services much better than I do. Um, and they don't have sufficient time or financial resource to commit. 
And so all of these things give me an idea of who I'm looking for and perhaps who I'm not looking for. And what I do on the back of this is, this is kind of a silly exercise, but I promise it's very effective. I start creating good personas for the traits that I am looking to attract and bad personas for the traits which I don't really want in the community. So some of mine are, I have community Carl, and this is someone who's very passionate about community. They run a community or they're desperate to launch one. I have kind Kate. This is someone who's really, you know, a very empathetic, warm, sweet person um, and the kind of person that I love to help and work with maybe responsive Rachel. This is someone who throughout the application process, they're constantly emailing back very rapidly. They're desperate to be part of it. They're very chatty. Um, and therefore I know they're probably going to be quite a chatty active member inside the community as well. And then bad personas. We have mean Mike. This is someone who's perhaps not a very nice person. Uh, and of course not the kind of member, which I might want. There's overly busy Beth. This is someone who is, you know, so frenetic, so busy all the time. Maybe they're very successful, but because, the, because of that, they're too busy to actually participate in a community of this nature. Maybe client service Chris, who is someone, like I say, in client services, maybe not the right uh, model for someone that I, I want to work with. Or unclear Ursula, this is someone who just has no idea where they're at. And the whole point of giving names is, Whenever I speak with someone on social media or someone's trying to apply for the community for the next cohort, I can start picking these out and say, oh, okay, great. They're a kind K and a responsive Rachel, tick, tick, tick. You know, this is someone that's a good fit or maybe like, oh, okay, they're, they're pretty unresponsive. They seem too busy. Maybe they're an overly busy Beth. And so I can start like mentally assigning or, or noting down these different personas. Um, so hopefully that is helpful for everyone. And realize as well, this is not about serving everyone. You're not the right fit for everyone. And not everyone is the right fit for you. And that's a beautiful thing when you realize that, because instead of desperately trying to get anyone and everyone into your community, you can say, you know what, this community is not the right fit for you, but my friend's community or, or service over here is exactly what you need. And there's a lot of power in that. So don't try and pander to everyone. Do be quite decisive in who you're actually trying to serve. Um, and then what you want to do on the back of this, so you've got your value proposition, you've defined your ideal member, you want to start structuring your brand and your platforms to attract uh, more of these ideal members. So I would start with auditing your social profiles, look at your bio section, look at your profile picture and the content you're putting out. Use language and tonality that you know is going to resonate with the people that you're actually looking to attract. Speak to the pain points of your ideal members. This is so, so powerful. So through a lot of these conversations that you've been having with people to more deeply understand them, you should actually be asking questions. What are they struggling with when it comes to your key topic or, that your community offers? And then take notes. And when you're actually planning content, speak to the things they're struggling with and they will resonate with your content much deeper. And refuse to be drawn into areas that aren't your specialist area. So over the years, I've talked on all kinds of aspects of business and entrepreneurship and creativity and design, but now I'm really enjoying, um, you know, fully committing and being fully niched into the world of community building. And you have to be quite strict with this. So my friend the other day, um, who has quite a big platform, asked me to come on and talk about, you know, the nature of entrepreneurship um, and if everyone could be an entrepreneur. And I could definitely speak on that topic and I'm quite passionate about that topic, but I had to say, no, sorry, I'm only speaking about community building these days because otherwise I'm going to show up in these places and people are not going to know me as the community guy. They're going to know me as the entrepreneurship guy or the design guy, and that will muddy my brand. So I think there's tremendous power in just staying in your lane and really committing and thinking, I'm only going to put content out about this thing. I'm only going to go on podcasts and talk about this thing. I'm only going to join wonderful events like this and talk about this thing. Uh, and suddenly you are consistently known as the specialist and the authority in that area. And you can see some examples here. So in the top left, uh, I've structured my bio to talk you know, about what I do and, and specifically around community. On the right, you can see much of my content. In fact, all my content is about community building and trying to break it down and make it very practical and actionable for people. And then the bottom left, I'm looking kind of silly um, because I'm wearing this sparkly, glittery jacket that I have. And that kind of maps to what I talked about, about not taking myself too seriously. So I'm not looking to attract people who have to wear a suit and tie and be uber professional. That's not really my personality. And so I'm not afraid to be a little bit silly in some of my content. And that attracts people that resonate with that kind of vibe. So once you've done this, I think it's imperative to actually carve out time 
Outside of creating content on your own platforms, you need to get in front of other communities that are filled with your ideal members. So when you're doing this, think about relevance and quality. Just to break this down, relevance is how many of the audience members that you're getting in front of are going to be interested in your topic. And so if you are, for example, uh, a CrossFit community or something like that, and you go and speak of a speak in front of a general fitness community, um, maybe only 5-10% of that community care about CrossFit. So there is, you know, not a high degree of relevance, but if you go and speak in front of a dedicated CrossFit community, then every single member there is going to care about CrossFit and potentially be a good fit for your CrossFit community. Um, and then quality as well. You need to really think, is this a high quality audience? So I, I know, for example, today, this is very meta. This is a piece of distribution, right? I'm here wanting to provide value and help as many of you as possible to understand the uh, inner workings of community. But this is a great opportunity too for me to speak to new people, not already within my current audience. And I've done this you know, a, a lot recently, but for example, I spoke um, and gave a workshop at Circle. Circle is the platform that I use to run my community. They have their own community full of their customers, all of whom are community builders. So when I gave a workshop on Circle, every single person there cared about community. There was a very high degree of relevance and quality because they were all paying customers of Circle. So they kind of self-validated as someone that's willing to invest in their communities. Um, but I do give talks to general entrepreneurship communities and um, you know talks such as today, and I love them, um, but I also realize not every person here is gonna care about community. I think everyone should care about community, um, but I realize it might not be a good fit for every attendee, and that's fine. It's just about being intentional or managing expectations with the distribution content you're putting out there. Um, and so once you have you know, these members, you're working to attract them, you're getting in front of new audiences to try and attract some of these ideal members, I believe in creating friction at the point of application for your community. Um, so I'm going to break down exactly how I do that very in depth. First and foremost, I'm a huge fan of using a wait list. I think it's dangerous just to publicly open the doors to your community and anyone can join because you have no control over the members um, who are joining and then you may as well have not created this ideal member persona in the first place. So you're trying to create a wait list to filter out your ideal members within that. Um, and why should you filter members? Well, First of all, as I say, it ensures that the applicants actually meet your pre-established persona that you've worked so hard on. It also allows potential members to qualify themselves as engaged and suitable before they even join. You know, different people are going to show different levels of engagement at the point of application. So you're going to see the people that will likely be very active within your community as well. Of course, it's going to weed out people that aren't suitable, that don't fit that ideal member persona. And because of all this work up front, it's going to lead to lower churn, which is the percentage of members who cancel and um, you know quit your community. It's going to mean less moderation because you're not just letting anyone in and it's a mess and that's going to take a lot of bandwidth to manage. Um, so less moderation and just generally a healthier, more focused community culture. And culture is so imperative within any community. So here's a couple of common ways to filter members. Um, starting from the bottom, you can do it by price. So if you charge for your community, you will likely attract people that are more serious and more committed than if it's just an open free community. And there's also by effort. So I'm a huge believer in this. I think you should give members that are applying hoops to jump through to basically prove that they are truly engaged and will actually be active in your community. So, for example, think about how active do you want your members to be? How do you expect them to behave in your community? Um, for example, it could be you'd love them to spend two hours or more per week in your community. You'd love them to be really active, starting threads and posting comments. You want them to be kind and considerate to other members. And over time, maybe they're going to actually evolve to become a leader in your community um, or a moderator or something of that nature. And the way I think about this is, if they won't do whatever the point of effort is, they won't do what you're expecting of them. So to give you an example, this is um, you know, a pretty typical application process that I tend to use. If someone's on my email list, that's often where I will share about upcoming cohorts first. So straight away, by being on the email list, they're showing a degree of engagement beyond you know, just any random stranger. Then 
if they open the emails and click the emails, that's a smaller percentage of people who are even more engaged. If they click through then to the waitlist, uh, not everyone's going to bother to fill out the waitlist because it's somewhat lengthy. So the people that actually bother to fill out the waitlist, again, are showing even more engagement. And then once people have applied, we follow up with them, we send them an email and not everyone responds to that email. So the ones that do show that they're even more engaged again. We send them an actual email exercise um, for them to complete, which tells us how they want to use the community and tells us more about them. And again, not everyone completes that. So the ones that do show they're more engaged. And then the end sign up process, once they've gone through all of that, again, they've shown good levels of engagement. So this is how I think about it. At the top, you have some level of interest, um, but if you drop off there, you're obviously going to probably be a lower average quality of member. If we just let everyone in at that top point, um, you know, all these disengaged people, people that perhaps can't be bothered to respond to an email um, or complete an application process, they're probably not going to be the engaged, helpful members you want inside the community. And at the bottom, people that have gone through all of these stages and all of these steps and invested all of this effort, just in applying, remember you haven't even let them in yet, they are almost certainly going to be a much higher quality of member um, and a great contributor within your community.